Hi, this is Sharon Patterson. I'm coming to you from the press room here at General Conference 2012 in Tampa, Florida. We have encountered lots of North Texans, and they have lots of opinions about what is going on. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Reverend Wendy Curran. I'm from Custer Road United Methodist Church in Plano, Texas, a proud member of the North Texas Annual Conference. This is my first ever general conference. I'm here as, as an observer and just really learning so much uh, and watching this process actually happen and sort of unfold before my eyes. Um, it's been exciting to see so many bold changes on uh, legislation and, and, and ideas and petitions coming up. And um, so far, nothing really major has passed. I'm a little disappointed, as our delegation is too, but I have faith that God is at work and moving in the right direction and that amazing and good and bold and Fruitful things will happen as a result of this annual conference and that our church will be different and our church will be strengthened and our church will be uh, out there making disciples just as we are called to do by Jesus Christ. So it's been a great time. I'm looking forward to more. Thanks. Well, good evening, good folks. Uh, my name is Frank Alegria. I'm district superintendent of the North Central District, North Texas Conference. And it's an honor to be here, here at General Conference 12 in Tampa, Florida. I I've been here now for almost a week, in fact, a little over a week. And knowing that God is doing great and marvelous things to the General Conference. But I will tell you this, I have learned that following legislation and seeing it through to completion is, is a challenge. I'm so proud of Don Underwood and, and, and Jan Davis and so many others in our delegation that they have been faithful, they have been informed, and they have been involved. And I'll tell you this, we are a blessed conference because of these individuals and their leadership and the entire delegation. I'll also encourage you to log in live streaming, uh, you know, www.umc.org and really get a flavor as to what's happening in General Conference. Yes, you can read blogs, you can read tweets, you can be Facebook, but I'll also tell you, look, look at the, the live streaming, be informed, continually pray for the conference and realize that God is doing a new thing locally and globally. It's also was the time for me, uh, now that I'm not a delegate, but I came as a visitor representing the annual conference, to, re to renew some friendships, to make some new ones, and to know that, that God is a God of, of this entire world and calls us to be in that connection called United Methodists in this world. I am honored to be here. I, I, I'm, 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 a blessed, I'm a blessed individual because I'm a blessed clergy member of the North Texas Conference. Oh, may God bless you and keep you always. This is Reverend Donna Whitehead from Lover's Line United Methodist Church in the North Texas Conference. This is my sixth general conference to attend, uh, not always as a delegate, but just to be here. And I can say that I think this is the very best conference we've ever had because there's a spiritual emphasis here that I just love. It's a spiritual energy. I think it probably has been a gift to brought to us uh, through the Africans and the uh, and this inner spiritual energy that they have, I've been a part of the general administration. Uh, I've been an observer there, and from the beginning, I noticed that uh, it was the Africans who taught us to make the first things first, but put that which was important at the center of of our, our life together. And so it started with them teaching us to sing basic songs of the faith and went to teaching us about how important it is to be collaborative and cooperative in our work together uh, rather than being competitive. I've noticed that there's been a general sense, a shift in um, the old rules, uh, to having to uh, have winners and losers to a process in which we all won. Uh, I think we are all winning because of the in increased intention being given to relationships and uh, to getting to know each other rather than just passing legislation. Uh, I watch this in the general administration area and have seen it, though, throughout the general conference in several other areas. So thanks be to God for this new time in the life of the church and the new way in which we are working together. My name is Bill Lawrence. I'm the dean at Perkins School of Theology, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and I'm a clergy member, elder in full connection in the North Texas Conference. I came to Tampa at the site of the 2012 General Conference 
on uh, uh, Sunday a week ago. Uh, I've been here actually nine days now. As a member of the Judicial Council of the United Methodist Church, I had to be here for our normal spring meeting of the council. And then I stayed for some meetings that involved the deans and the presidents of the 13 United Methodist schools and then participated in the official actions of the General Conference starting actually last Tuesday night. Uh, I've been involved in uh, attending legislative committees uh, where much of the work is done, particularly I sat in on a legislative committee that uh, was dealing with petitions and proposals concerning the Ministerial Education Fund. This is the apportionment of the United Methodist Church that is primarily responsible for generating the funds which are uh, used to support the annual conference programs of theological education uh, through their Board of Ordained Ministry uh, and uh, the work of the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry in Nashville. But 75% of the receipts from the Ministerial Education Fund goes as an allocation directly to the 13 United Methodist Schools of Theology. Perkins, being one of them, has an active interest in how those funds are calculated and allocated uh, and some of the decisions that are made. So I was very interested to track several of the petitions and to see what kinds of amendments uh, might be proposed. We're in the midst of the general conference. Plenary sessions are still uh, underway to vote on the final adoption of the legislation. But I think a few things are becoming clear. One certainly is that there is tremendous support that appears widespread for the work that our 13 schools of theology are doing. Our mission at Perkins is to prepare women and men for faithful leadership in Christian ministry and to do that in the context of the borderlands region where we're located, the borderlands of the U.S. and Latin America, to do it in the context of the university and most importantly to do it in the context of the church, specifically the United Methodist Church. So we feel a great responsibility to be attentive to the interests of the United Methodist Church and are grateful for the resources of the church that come our way through the Ministerial Education Fund. I hope by the end of the General Conference that affirmation will continue to be felt and heard on all sides. This is Dr. Maria Dixon Hall, Southern Methodist University, Dallas, Texas, North Texas Conference, Highland Park United Methodist Church. Well, the last week here at general conference gave us a lot to think about and in my blog the view from Dixon Hall I really talk about uh, how the plan to restructure fell apart on Saturday night one of the things that we need to keep in mind that as we have these holy conferences about uh, general conference restructuring is the fact that we stand at the precipice just like the Southern Baptists did in 1979 we're making a choice of whether we're going to move into the, f the future or we're going to stay behind but on Saturday night, what was displayed was uh, really two things, arrogance and ignorance. Uh, the IOT, which had wonderful ideas in it, displayed an arrogance in terms of communication. They communicated as if their plan was a foregone conclusion rather than what it was, an excellent starting point. And this would come back to bite them because in the end, individuals really didn't understand that that plan could have been a great launching point. And then we turn to our friends at Plan B, who understood the fact that uh, the folks in IoT had not really done the great communication job they could have done, and instead, using that sense of exclusion that many people felt about the IoT, they opened it up. And what I have to say about the Plan B plan is that what it, had, it did was encourage voices that had not yet had a chance to feel like they were at the table. However, uh, sometimes in the sense of over-promising, our colleagues in Plan B may have empowered really who I would lay the blame at, which is the MFSA. What MFSA did in the subcommittee was incredibly dangerous. What they did was pander to our colleagues from Central Conference, particularly the Africans, by telling them that it's all about inclusion, when it was really all about a progressive agenda that did not serve uh, our African brothers and sisters, but served the limited interests of MFSA. It was a clear case in which progressives, well-meaning progressives, actually utilize race and age as a silencing tool against the rest of the subcommittee. For 
every single victory that MFSA thought they won, they actually diminished the plan B so that it would never get to the conference floor. And that is exactly what happened on Saturday night. Because of all the MFSA amendments, all of the, the plan B that could have gone to the floor and had a minority report and great debate fell apart. If there's blame to be laid anywhere, it has to be with my friends at MFSA who overreached, who were not knowledgeable how, about how the game was played. And anytime you're dealing with organizational change, you've got to come prepared. The fact that MFSA did not understand how their amendments would change the financial scope of the general conference and the general agencies, did not understand how it would change the composition, and yet kept yelling inclusion without understanding how to bring people together in shared meaning and shared understanding shows a naivete that says they're not ready to play. So that's the view from Dixon Hall here at General Conference 2012.